You're listening to True Crime Feed. Welcome to True Crime Feed. I'm your host, Angela Ferrari, reviewing the best true crime podcast from the past decade, plus my top three true crime picks of the week. First on the docket, here's a show from the archives I think you will really enjoy. Let's discuss the case for Suspect Season 1 from Wondery. Here's a synopsis from the show creators. It's Halloween. The residents of Valley View Apartments organize a big costume party. Strangers come together. They argue and fight. They dance and drink. At times, the party veers out of control. And when they wake up the next morning, one resident is dead. Yeah, is that one of the best hooks for a true crime podcast or what? And I am going to start off with a warning. I am going to reveal spoilers all throughout this episode. So if you want to remain completely spoiler free, pause this show and tune in to Suspect Season 1 and meet me back here in exactly 291 minutes. I'll wait. JK, JK. But from here on out, I'm dropping names. You've been warned. Also, before you listen to today's show, go to thetruecrimefeed.com and sign up for my newsletter where I curate visual aids to accompany the show. The internet has scrubbed a lot of the names and faces associated with this case to avoid online harassment and public shaming. Weird, does that happen on the internet? But I did find beautiful photos of Arpana Janaga, whose life was tragically cut short. I also have photos of the apartment complex, our amazing host, Matthew Shear, and a few other folks associated with this haunting story. Now, let's get into character. It's the night of Halloween, 2008, and we have a costume party to go to. What are you wearing? Here's a reminder of what was popular in the zeitgeist that year for your costume inspiration. Twilight, the Joker played by Heath Ledger, Sarah Palin. I think I'm going to dress up as Hannah Montana. Also, side note, did you guys know that Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus were the same person the whole time? What a twist. Okay, now that we are in our 2008 inspired costumes, let's stroll over to the Valley View apartment complex. It's situated in Redmond, Washington State, right outside of Seattle. This is a nice, affluent area, lots of tech jobs, trendy bistros, and very low crime. The apartments in Valley View are dated but livable. The perfect crash pad for young 20-somethings who like to work hard and play hard. Flyers for the costume party are posted all around Valley View. The whole building is invited. The celebration is going to take place in four adjoining apartments. Each apartment has its own theme. There is the 1960s with groovy hippie decor, a winter wonderland with snowflakes and Christmas lights, a pirate theme, and the 24-year-old Valley View resident Arpana Janaga goes all out in her apartment with a haunted forest theme. The perfect backdrop for her Little Red Riding Hood costume. She is so excited to celebrate her first Halloween in America. Soon, the party is in full swing. Arp and his good friend Rachel arrives dressed as a sexy cop, and her boyfriend Sean is a robber. A guy named Emmanuel gets invited to the party by a Valley View resident. He threw together a construction worker outfit. Emmanuel doesn't really know anyone at the party, but he makes fast friends with Rachel and the other guests. A fellow named Chris decides to use his scruffy beard to his advantage and attends the party as Jesus. He really gets a kick out of himself when he slaps a label marked water on his beer can. Because, like, Jesus turned water into wine. (laughs) Okay, Chris. Also, he invited his stepbrother, Neil. They don't mention what Neil was wearing, but nearly everyone later on described him as a sketch ball. More on that later. But for now, everybody in this apartment complex getting tipsy. The host, Matthew Shear, has this incredibly on-point description about the energy of parties. They all have their own life and moods. 
There are those euphoric parties with everyone on the same wavelength, loving and celebrating the moment. But sometimes a party can have a dark energy. Tension ratchets up. There is a feeling of hostility and aggression in the air. This Halloween party at Valley View started out like the first kind and quickly turned into the second. I'm going to go ahead and blame that on Neil. He starts out by getting extremely plastered, and then he challenges every dude to an arm wrestling match. Because chicks really dig that. Then he wants to show off his boxing moves. Emmanuel, the construction worker, and the annihilated Neil have a, quote, friendly spar. But it turns aggro, and Neil takes a cheap shot that draws blood. Oh, and sketch monster Neil also follows Rachel up to a bedroom as she tries to adjust her cop costume. He makes a pass at her and she rebuffs him immediately. Then Sketchosaurus Neil has the audacity to ask, Uh, well, do you think Arpana might get with me then? Rachel disgustedly replies, don't even think about it. She would never go for you. Neil's feelings are hurt. Gosh, you don't have to be so rude about it. Rachel pushes past Neil and does her best to avoid him for the rest of the party. Meanwhile, her boyfriend Sean the Robber somehow gets in a drunken argument with one of his good friends and things come to blows. Arpana tries to settle the vibe down and invites all of the party goers into her apartment for some frozen pizza. Things do calm down a little bit and then a neighbor of Arpana's named Cameron gets home from work and joins the party. Cameron and Arpana have a friendly, slightly flirty banter. He is sober and needs to catch up with the other party goers. Cameron finds a devil mask and has people over to his apartment for vodka shots. Him and Emmanuel bond over music. Just the two of them go down to the parking lot and sit in Cameron's car to listen to some techno jams for about 20 minutes. I know, right? Listening to techno in a car for over 20 minutes with a total rando? And this isn't even the scariest part of the story yet. Mercifully, the techno bros turn off the jams and return to the party. At this time, it's getting really late. People's memories start to go in and out. Most of the non-residents start to leave the party. I think they actually had to pay Sketchball Neil to leave. And a small core group of residents gather in a first floor apartment to cap off the night. Arpana tells Rachel how lucky she must have been to grow up in the United States, that it was really hard for her to grow up as a girl in India. Rachel makes the comment that things weren't always easy here in America for girls either, but Arpana bursts into tears and says, you have no idea. She repeats it again more forcefully. You have no idea. Arpana leaves crying and heads up to her apartment. That's the last time her friends see her alive. A murder takes place at a Halloween costume party. It's a catchy hook for a seemingly entertaining true crime story. But once you're in the door and these people become real, the party's over. You're going to start to feel haunted by this tragedy and want to see resolution in this case. And this shift of emotion all happens when you learn more about Arpana Janaga. She grew up in Hyderabad, India. Her father was a professor of computer engineering and her mother stayed at home to raise her and her sister. Arpana had plural passions. She loved the arts, singing, gymnastics, but she was also a tech prodigy, winning a hardware design contest and earning a reputation as a rising star in computer engineering. She was featured in the New Indian Express in an article titled Young Inventors. Several universities and potential employers wanted to recruit this talented female to their STEM programs in India. But Arpana always had her eyes set on America. She finally fulfilled her dream when she attended Rutgers University for her postgrad and then landed a job as a software engineer at Dell EMC. The higher-ups took notice of her brilliance and work ethic. Even though Arpana was only employed for less than six months, she was already in line for a big promotion. And when she wasn't hard at work, Arpana had another dream that she finally fulfilled. She got herself a motorcycle, a sweet little Suzuki. She even joined a local motorcycle club, the Pacific Northwest Riders. 
Arpana lacked riding experience, and at one point she was even doing some maintenance work on her bike, and it tipped over on her. She was pinned, stuck, and a neighbor had to help lift it off. But Arpana never let an obstacle deter her. She was fearless and enthusiastic, and she learned how to keep up with the other experienced riders in her motorcycle club, going on beautiful scenic rides all around Washington State. I know, right? Didn't she sound so cool? Like, almost too cool? Like, I feel like I'd be intimidated to meet someone that boss. But people that actually knew her said that Arpana welcomed everybody. Even though she had moved to Redmond, not knowing a single soul in the area, she grew a whole community of friends in a short time. Oh, and as if this all wasn't impressive enough, Arpana also volunteered at the Redmond Fire Department and at the local animal shelter as well. Oh, and she also took Taekwondo and was a talented singer in her spare time. Yep, we have officially reached Disney princess slash Marvel movie hero territory. And all of these remarkable experiences reached by the age of 24. Seriously, just imagine what this woman could have accomplished in her entire lifetime. I warned you, it stops being fun, like you are just trying to enjoy a party and some sketchball rando comes up and punches you in the face. When you hear about Arpana's life being cut short, you feel like this is a loss for humanity and that her killer needs to be brought to justice. So let's talk suspects. Who's your number one? Wait, let's say it together on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three, Neil! Jinx, you owe me a Coke. Or even better, a beer with a label marked water on it. <laughs> so funny. Yeah, Neil the Sketchball seems like the obvious suspect. But he was ruled out. According to Neil, he tried to hook up with Arpana that night and even made it into her bedroom, but was sock blocked when neighbor Cameron walked in. According to Neil, Cameron was coming off super jelly of him. They all went back downstairs and Neil walked seven miles home first stopping at a convenience store, which had him on video. From there, he goes home to sleep. And his family all confirmed this. I'm sure the annihilated Neil didn't make a subtle, sneaky entrance. The security tape and the alibis rule Neil out as being the murderer. <sighs> all right, Neil, go off, roam free, have fun challenging wild bears to arm wrestling. See ya, punk. So let's go over the other possibilities. Key players at the party were Rachel the cop, her boyfriend Sean the robber, Neil's stepbrother Chris dressed like Jesus, aka Chris Christ, Emmanuel the construction worker, latecomer neighbor Cameron who puts on the devil mask, and oh, I also forgot to mention that at the time of her death, Arpana was dating a guy named Aaron who was attending x-ray school. She met Aaron through the motorcycle club. They had only dated a few months. Aaron was going to be relocating for work when he finished school. They were young and enjoying their time together. It sounded like a very early 20s relationship. They didn't want to put labels on anything. Arpana invited Aaron to her Halloween party, but he had plans to go out bar hopping with his buddies. Arpana claimed she wasn't mad, but Aaron could tell she was disappointed he wasn't going. So he's out until 4.30 with his friends, and then Aaron crashes at his own apartment. He doesn't find it weird that Arpana hasn't called him the rest of the weekend. Her parents back in India do find it weird that they haven't heard from their daughter. She is dutifully in touch with them nearly every day. They call a family friend in Washington State to drive over to her apartment and check on her. The family friend arrives and spots a neighbor in the hallway, Cameron. They work together to gain access to Arpana's apartment and discover her body. The crime scene is brutal, and I'm not going to go into details, but the descriptions are very graphic on the show. The person who did this clearly worked hard to destroy potential evidence. Arpana's cause of death was strangulation, possibly a ligature made from duct tape or maybe a bootlace or both. After multiple witness interviews and evidence collection, police narrow in on their guy, and it's someone we know. Emmanuel, the construction worker, is charged with the murder of Arpana Janaga. He is charged in 2011, but his trial doesn't start until 2017. Ah, behold, the majestic beauty of the American justice system. All right, let's shift gears and report for jury duty. 
and we're going to sit in on Emmanuel's trial. What are you wearing? I want to look classy, but still comfortable. So I'm thinking like a velour tracksuit, right? Are they still in style? I mean, who am I kidding? Velour tracksuits never go out of style. Juicy Couture, call me and you can sponsor the show. All right, let's settle in and begin the case. Here is the prosecution's argument against Emmanuel. According to his phone records, the night of the Halloween party, Emmanuel made around 20 calls to separate women. Prosecutors infer he was looking for a hookup. When none of those panned out, they postulate he must have pursued Arpana. Okay, interesting theory, I guess. But now they bring up the DNA evidence. Investigators found Emmanuel's DNA on a roll of duct tape, the same kind of tape that was potentially used to strangle Arpana. Oh, and there was also Emmanuel's DNA on a bloody bathrobe found at the crime scene. Wow. So let's take a quick poll. What do you think? Doesn't look great for Emmanuel, but let's hear from the defense team. According to Emmanuel's attorney, there is an easy explanation for why his DNA is found around the crime scene. Emmanuel was in Arpana's apartment, in particular in her bathroom cleaning up after getting bloody sucker punched by Neanderthal Neil. The same bathroom where Arpana most likely kept her bathrobe. And hey, guess what? DNA from several men were found at the crime scene, including many of Arpana's neighbors and partygoers. That's the thing about DNA. It doesn't tell you when someone was in contact with evidence. Also, what kind of DNA are we talking about? Blood, saliva, the other word for sailor, men of the sea? Yes, all of it. There was a little bit of everything from a lot of different folks because it was a drunken party. That includes touch DNA. And let's just say touch DNA is touchy. Really touchy. I mean, you could say it's more sensitive than Neil's ego. When the prosecution linked Emmanuel's DNA to the roll of tape that was possibly used to strangle Arpana, they failed to mention that his DNA was found in such minuscule quantities that they had to send it out to a special lab called True Allele for testing. Oh, and two other male DNA profiles were found on that same tape. Holy shnikes, that's all you guys have? I dressed up in my nicest magenta velour tracksuit, gave it a few passes with a lint roller before leaving the house to come to court for this? Yo, am I on punked? Wait, what year is this again? 2017? Yo, am I on ridiculousness right now? Why on earth did the cops think Emmanuel was their man? Oh, wait, did I not mention that Emmanuel was the only black guy at the party? And that the Redmond police force were very inexperienced when it came to investigating homicides? Oh, whoopsie daisy. I don't think any of the evidence presented in court against Emmanuel was compelling enough to charge him, let alone convict him. But there is something from Emmanuel's past that I found extremely unsettling. And jurors in this case weren't privy to this information because Emmanuel's defense attorney had it successfully ruled out as irrelevant. At the time of Arpana's death, Emmanuel was on probation for an alleged sexual assault. The victim's description of this assault is terrifying. But Emmanuel claims the encounter was consensual. He was 20 at the time and the girl was 15. At the very least, this is statutory rape. He took an Alford plea and served three years and was labeled a level one sex offender, which is the level given to someone the courts deem as least likely to reoffend. I really grappled with this piece of information. Personally, I think it's important. Uh, it changes how I see Emmanuel, but he did do his time for the crime. And I understand why this information isn't allowed to be discussed in trial because it would prejudice the jury. And in hindsight, it is crystal clear to me that it prejudiced the cops in this case. They put all their eggs in one basket when there was as much evidence, if not more, to charge another suspect with the murder of Arpana Janaga. So uh, let's take a ride in the true crime DeLorean time machine. Side note, I'm going to do a whole episode dedicated to John DeLorean in the future. So stay tuned, buckle up and ready for that one, y'all. For now, let's hop back to the alternate 2008 and sit in on the trial against Neighbor Cameron, who was the latecomer to the Halloween party and later wore a devil mask. You might also remember he helped discover Arpana's body. Cameron also has some interesting phone records after the party. 
Unlike Emmanuel, who called pretty much every woman in Seattle, Cameron called one woman after the party ended. That one person was Arpana. He called her once at 2.65 a.m. and then a second time at 3.02 a.m. Upon first interrogation, Cameron claimed not to remember these calls, but when police confronted him with cell records, Cameron responded, oh crap. Around 3 a.m., a different neighbor in an apartment that adjoined Arpana's claimed he heard moaning noises coming from her apartment and then a loud thud. He attributed this to a consensual sexual encounter, but in hindsight had second thoughts. Another neighbor of Valley View arrived home from the night shift around 3 a.m. and saw a man standing in the doorway of Arpana's apartment. He couldn't see for sure who this person was enough to make a positive identity, but he was positive this guy was white. Oh, and also Arpana's cell phone and digital camera were missing from the scene. And Cameron had printed off some maps for pawn shops the day after the murder. I don't know if Cameron actually brought Arpana's phone and camera to a pawn shop. And guess what? The police don't know either because they never followed that lead. <laughs> I told you this was fun. Ah, but I do know for sure that Cameron drove several hours to the Canadian border without stopping or declaring himself. He was turned away because he didn't have his passport. Cameron told police, quote, he just kind of wanted to explore. Oh, and Cameron's DNA was also found on the bathrobe and on a bottle of motor oil that was possibly used to destroy evidence at the crime scene. Ah, now this is a case. I would put on my best baby blue track suit that I reserve for the specialist of occasions along with my Ugg boots and fedora to sit in on this case. But this isn't the alternate 2008. And even though all of this evidence against Cameron is real, he was never charged and therefore never goes to trial. Emmanuel was found not guilty in his case, and now he's currently suing Kings County, Redmond, Washington State. As of this recording, there has been no justice for the tragic murder of Arpana Janaga. Let's hope someone out there even half as brilliant as Arpana can take a look at her cold case and put an end to this once and for all. Until then, we're all out in the world going about our day, our work, and attending parties with her possible killer. So have yourself a great day, everyone. Y'all, this was a long episode, but I still left out so much. This is a story that left my mind racing in all kinds of directions and grappling with how do you get justice for Arpana while ensuring that everyone gets a fair trial. I didn't even tell you, there are even more alternative suspects to Cameron that you can make a case against, including serial killer Israel Keys. It is so easy to sit back, listen to an entertaining podcast, and point the finger like, oh, he did it. But if you really put yourself in the mindset of a juror, this case stops being the fun kind of a party and starts getting Neil. Ugh, like a cheap shot sucker punch right to the gut. Hashtag you got Neiled. Listen to season one of Suspect and tell me your thoughts. Email me directly at Angela at the truecrimefeed.com or join the True Crime Feed Facebook discussion group. Keep an open mind and don't be a Neil. Stay tuned till after the break to hear my top three podcast power ranking of the week. Hey, True Crime Feed listeners, I have a teensy little ask of you. I need your help to grow my audience so I can keep the stories coming. So I'm asking you to take a moment and share True Crime Feed with five friends you think will enjoy the show. Like a fun, awesome pyramid scheme, but you still get to hang on to your money. Cool. And if you want extra gold stars, go to Apple Podcasts and write a review for True Crime Feed. I am an independent one woman show, and you taking a moment to do this will help me grow and compete with the big networks out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now back to the show. And we're back. Here are the three shows currently trending on the charts that I think are worth your attention. I present to you this week's podcast power ranking. 
At the number three spot, we have Believe in Magic. Here's a synopsis from the show page. Charity, celebrity, illness, and control. The extraordinary story of a teenage girl and her charity, Believe in Magic, which ends up challenging the very nature of sickness itself. Yep, we have a little bit of Scamanda vibes happening here with this one, except this is about a teenage girl who's obsessed with One Direction. Is she faking, or are the internet sleuths just being terrible, harassing a sick, innocent person? Wait, does that kind of stuff happen on the internet? This show is very well made, and so far, yes, I do believe in magic. At the number two spot, we once again have Scamanda. Here's a quick rundown reminder about the show. Amanda is a wife, a mother, a blogger, a Christian, a charming, beautiful, bubbly young woman who lives life to the fullest. But Amanda is dying with a secret she doesn't want anyone to know. She starts a blog detailing her cancer journey and becomes an inspiration, touching and captivating her local community, as well as followers all over the world. Until one day, investigative producer Nancy gets an anonymous tip telling her to look at Amanda's blog, setting Nancy on an unimaginable road to uncover Amanda's secret. This is how I know I'm listening to an awesome podcast, when I have this incredible inkling to Google the person and find out what happens, but instead I resist and keep waiting week after week for a new episode to drop. I am here for this thrilling ride. Scamanda is scum awesome. And at the number one spot, you already know, we once again have Silence the Radio Murders. Here's a quick recap. A chilling wave of murders sweeps through Little Haiti, a Miami neighborhood that is home to many Haitian exiles. The victims are radio broadcasters using the airways to demand democracy at home. Little Haiti is up in arms, calling for justice for the fallen heroes, but the investigation stalls. To this day, the masterminds remain free, and rumors persist about cocaine trafficking, CIA assets, and transnational coups. Alrighty, four weeks in a row, and I'm going to officially put this in the Hall of Fame and change up my rankings for next week. But I needed to give this show one final shout out. If HBO wants to create a prestige TV drama that could hold up to the wire, they should script this story and use this reporting as its source material. I will give you my final thoughts as the series concludes, but for now, I am inducting Silence the Radio Murders to my true crime feed, Hall of Fame. Now for my miss of the week. We have Whiskey Creek. Here's a synopsis. Whiskey Creek is the untold story of a Halloween night massacre. Three people are found dead in a makeshift encampment deep in the woods. Beside them, four dead dogs and a burned out trailer. The victims are squatters with complicated backgrounds and criminal histories. Their deaths raise important questions about the Canadian criminal justice system and who that system protects. Okay, I'll say up front, this show creator slash lead investigator, Laura Palmer, is an incredible person. She's out there actually doing the work, investigating cold cases, advocating for victims and their families, and shining light on important stories. She is awesome at everything except narrating the podcast. I wish she would sit back, take a well-deserved break, and let someone else do the narration for what has the potential to be a top-ranking show. And honestly, it's not just her. Her male co-host has the same monotone delivery. And I know I can be a little extra on the mic, but this is way too robotic for me. So unfortunately, even though I applaud Laura and the work she does, I'm going to have to send Whiskey Creek down my podcast queue trapdoor. Find out next week who's going to be in the number one spot now that Silence the Radio Murders is in the Hall of Fame. Let me know what trending shows are in your top three and what show fell through your podcast queue trapdoor. I'll meet you here next week to dust off another superb true crime show from the archive for your next feeding fix. That's all for 
for today's true crime feed. Don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I post links to my top three favorite shows of the week and bring you fabulous visual aids for every episode. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to join the conversation. If you enjoyed this show, please leave a review and tell your fellow partners in crime to listen to True Crime Feed. Thanks for riding along and allowing me to be your audio accomplice. Join me next week for another feeding.